All right, let's pray. Father, we just thank you, God, for this another day, another Sabbath day that we can come to your house and, and just sing to you and, and just sing praises to you, God, because you are the Prince of Peace. And one day we all will bow down before you and call you the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, which you are truly are, even now, even in our midst today. And we thank you for being our King. We thank you for being our Savior, our Messiah, our saving grace. And we thank you so much, even, Father, for you, that you loved us so much that you didn't send your Son to us and that he shed his blood for us. And we thank you so much. And I pray that this day, God, that you'll be in our midst, that you'll ch change our hearts, our minds, our thoughts, our way, our thinking, the way we walk, we talk, and we pray that this day that you'll change all of those things with inside of each and every one of us to see you in a greater light for who you are and just how much you love us and how much you want us to serve you, which you are the king. And again, I pray that you just hide me behind that precious cross at the words I speak of you and you alone. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. All right. Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be in verse 6. Philippians 4. This is something that, um, while you're turning there, that has, has really been on me for a past little while. And, and I just want to kind of share it with you, I reckon. And I have found many things in, in the scriptures and a few things that actually I didn't even know that I come to find out. And that's the great thing about the Bible. The more you read, the more you study, and God will show you different things that you didn't even, <laughs> really didn't even know was in there. Or either to the point that you've read it time and time again, and just, boom, it just knocks you in the head, and it just wakes you up to a new light for something that begins to show you things. But we'll just read this. It's just uh, Philippians 4 and verse 6. And this is Paul talking to the church at Philippi. And he says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And notice it says in here, be anxious for nothing. You know, y'all know what that means. Anxious means to uh, to be troubled with cares. In other words, we, we weigh ourselves down with things in our lives, you know, that come along, different situations. We begin pondering on them. And, you know, the Bible tells us not to worry about tomorrow because tomorrow is enough worry in itself. But, you know, and it's just natural for each and every one of us when something comes along, we, we begin rolling it around in our heads. Next thing you know, we're... We're concerned about things that ain't even happened, things that possibly people ain't even said or just just making stuff up in our minds, you know, and the next thing you know, we're all worried about it. Webster says that the word anxious means experiencing worry, unease, or nervousness, typically about an in, imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome, you know, which basically it is. You know, we just like uh. And, and y'all know if you go to the doctor or something, you, you kind of get a little bit of anxious. You know, what is this person fixing to say? What is he going to tell me? What's, you know, what's wrong or, or whatever the case may be? You know, so we do. But Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 27, it says, Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubic to his statue? You know, how, you, even if you worry, you, you can't change it by worrying, by, by being worried about it or by being anxious. Even in Matthew 10 and 19, it says, but when, and this is a great example, and I like this in the Bible because it's a promise also. It said, but when, <clears throat> when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. And the reason I put that in there, have you ever had anybody come up to you and ask you about Jesus or about God or church or anything? And if you ever have, and, and I know that even, even for me at times, you know, whenever someone will ask me a question or something and I may not be real good familiar with it or something, I do, I get a little nervous because I don't want to give them the wrong answer. You know, and even if somebody asks me something I, I, and I don't know, I'll tell them, look, I'm not real familiar. I'd rather go and research it, study it, and come back to you. And, you know, have you ever asked, had anybody ask you, you know, about salvation? 
you know, and I've asked this time and time again, if somebody has, if somebody ever asks you about how do I come to know Jesus as my Savior, can you tell them? Can you honestly tell them? And if they do, how would you feel? Would you get nervous, you know, and, and, and begin fretting over, you know, trying to remember Scripture and stuff like that? This is a promise. Don't worry about it. Because, friends, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior and somebody comes up and tells, asks you something like that, he'll give you the words that they need to hear. Not that you need to hear, what they need to hear. And that's what he's saying. Don't be anxious about anything. Nothing. And I know it's hard. I, I know it is. I share this with you. In two weeks, I go for my scan. You know, so, I mean, you, 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 it's just it's natural. But don't use it as an excuse. The Bible says don't do it. Don't do it. He says don't be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. By prayer and supplication. You know what prayer is. This word supplica supplication, many times in the Bible it's used as prayer. Okay, it, it, it is, really, in a, in a sense, supplication is prayer. So we ask the question, why does he say prayer and supplication? Well, there, it's a difference. There is a difference. Supplication, this is, the Bible dictionary says it comes from a Latin verb, supplicare. Okay, which means to plead humbly. You can pray and not be humble. You can. It can be done. To plead humbly. Humbly, with supplication is often thought as a religious prayer. It can logically be applied to any situation in which you must entreat someone in power for help or of favor. Okay, so that's what it says in the Bible dictionary. You look it up in the Strong in this lexicon. It says a seeking, asking, entreating, entreating to God or to man. But there was a writer, and I found this, and I loved what he wrote, so I put it on here so I could read it. And this is what he said, the difference between supplication and prayer. And I want you to really listen to this. He said that supplication is a form of prayer, but considered as kneeling down and bending down. See the difference? Big difference. Kneeling down or bending down in which someone makes a humble petition or an entreaty to God. Prayer, however, can be defined as a sincere thanksgiving or request made to God. You see the simplicity of those things? In other words, supplication, you getting serious. You getting serious with God when you go in supplica prayer and supplication. That's what the Bible said do. Don't be anxious for anything but in prayer and supplication. So you pray. You know, you, you, can, you can pray anywhere. Anytime you get ready, whatever you want to do. And I, the more I got to study and looking at this, when you get serious with God, I mean really serious, when you truly get serious, I believe a person just about gets broken. That's when you get, that's when you get on your knees. That's when you plead, please hear my cries, oh God. You know, and you get serious with him, shedding tears, and you humble yourself before God. Anybody can pray. You know, drunks pray most every Friday or Saturday night. You know, hugging a toilet. Oh, God, get me out of this mess. They do. They usually pray more than Christians do. At least twice a week. Think about it. Anybody can pray. But whenever you get into a supplication, whenever you really get down. David said this in Psalm 6 and 9. says, the Lord has heard my supplication. He heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. And also said this in Psalms 30 and 8. says, I cried out to the Lord, cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. You see, he mentioned this twice. Mentioned it twice. So David, whenever he went to him, he meant business. So whenever we go to God, we need to go to him and mean business. Not just go and ask him because he's a Walmart or a Kroger or whatever. You know, anybody can pray. I remember <clears throat> I remember one time in, in Sunday school, this was years ago, this lady that taught Sunday school, she was a powerful Christian. I mean, she could just convey the word. I mean, just catch, just catch your attention and you just want to listen. Well, she shared a story about a young girl. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. This young girl, she was married, had children, 
and uh she'd come to church and and this type of stuff and and was you know saying that that they was doing all they could to make ends meet all they could do to keep food on the table for their children and this like stuff like this and and the lady said you know just pray really pray that god will bless you and deliver you you know with, with some food or whatever you need and get get right with it just get serious with it and she did she went to pray and she said father please we need meat on the table and said she was weeping and crying and it was just a few days later <clears throat> that there was a truck come driving by with a load of chickens you know and they was in these wooden crates y'all remember the, the little wooden crates that was on the chicken trucks and they have them strapped down one of the straps broke and a basket of those chickens fell off in that woman's yard got her supplied her with the chickens she had to pluck them and she had to skin them she said next time i'm going to pray that they're skinned <clears throat> she meant business she was coming before god humble please father feed my family and god blessed her so it gives you another thing be specific in your prayers be specific be specific. Tell him what, what you need. And then it turns around and says that we're supposed to do it with thanksgiving. How many times whenever we go to God that all we do, we go and we just give me, give me, give me, give me, help me, help me, help me, help me, give me, give me, help me. Do we ever stop and thank him? Truly thank him for the breath that we breathe, the family we have, the food on our table, the cars that run, a place to lay our head, air conditioning, heating, all of these different things. Even a television to where you can find out what the weather's going to do the next day to, to, that tells you how to dress. Do we think of these things? The church you go to, the cushions on the pews, the books or, or whatever we have. Do we truly thank Him for what he, what he gives us? Be anxious for nothing. All of this in prayer and thanksgiving. <clears throat> thanksgiving means gratitude. Gratitude. Actively grat uh, grateful language. Even grateful language, even in worship. Whenever we've done the song, whenever we've done the last song, did you listen to the words? Have you ever prayed a prayer like that to God? I know you're the king of kings, and I know one day I'm going to bow to you. I know one day I'm going to kneel before you. I know one day I'm going to call you the king of kings. I know one day that you're the majesty. I know that you're the one that's the salvation. Thank you for all of these things. Do we give thanks to him like we're supposed to? Do we do it the way the Bible says? Psalms 91, David says, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Or do we just babble words? I will tell of all your marvelous works. Have you ever praised God by telling someone else about Jesus? Have you ever done that? Have you ever been telling someone about your church or, or, or an event that God gave you and just totally just, and they, all they could see was the excitement because of what God did for you. And the whole time you may not even know it, but you're giving praise to God. Giving praise to Him for something that He did or shared or showed you. Psalms 95 and 2 says, Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. This tells me whenever we come to God, we need to be thanking Him. Before we go to begging. Thanking him for life. For love. For all of the things. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. Have you ever hollered at God? Have you? I have. I've got mad with him. And I shouted. And I talked to him like I wanted to talk to him. And I meant business. Because I was hurt. He already knew I was angry. He already did. He already knew I was mad. So I talked to him. And I did. Have you ever shouted to him? But have you ever turned around and shouted to him with praise? Thank you. Thank you for what you did. 
and just praise and just shout. You know what Psalms is? You know what the Psalms, S-P-S-L-A-M-S, I think you say it. That little word right there, that one little word means a sacred song. That's what that is, a sacred song. Have you ever sang verses to Jesus? Have you ever sang the Bible to him? Have you ever shouted a verse? Have you ever hollered at him and said, Look, your word says this. Do you not hear me? Pleading and crying and weeping on your knees. Don't you hear what I'm telling you? David did it. Does that mean we can't? Shouted. Shouted joy. Shouted praise. Shouted. Shouted joyfully to him. And goes on and says, For the Lord is, a, is the great God and the great King above all gods. And Ephesians 1 and 15 says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. The reason I put this in here, this was Paul talking about the church, that, that, that he prayed for the people. He was letting them know, I never stop praying for you. I never stop praying for you. Do we pray for family and friends? Do we pray for your church members, the people you know, other Christians? It says, making mention of you in my prayers. Psalms 104 says, and this is, this is, this is a, a great one. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Do you ever gave any thought to the fact that whenever you pray, whenever we're praying to the Father, you know you got to enter into something to get to Him? It says, enter His gates with thanksgiving. That tells me we need to be thanking Him more than begging. Think about it. Enter His gates with thanksgiving. Have you ever had anybody come into your home Walk straight into your home and go to belly and right out the gate. You don't want them up in there. I mean, you might have been having a great day and then all of a sudden they come dragging all their sorrow up in there. I mean, it may not be the best example, but listen, I mean, if, if it's God, don't you want to enter joyfully? Let Him know that you thank Him for everything that He does and then go to asking. Enter His gates. In other words, enter His domain or enter his presence with thanksgiving and then the verse goes on says enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise so there's another you you go into something and then there's like a courtyard okay you you go through the gate and then you're in the courtyard okay so you enter the gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise First you thank him and then you need to be praising him for what he did. Big difference. Big difference. Great big difference between thanking and praising. And then it says, be thankful to him and bless his name. Three things. Thank him, praise him, and bless his name. Because why? Because he's the king of kings. He's the almighty God. He's the very one that I mentioned over in Isaiah that he's seen. That very one. Prayer and supplication. Supplication, humbling ourselves before him. On our knees, bowing, pleading. Letting him know that we mean business. I'm not coming to you just asking you for a new car. I'm coming to you the way I'm supposed to come to you. The way I need to come to you. Giving you praise. Be anxious for nothing but in everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. It says, let your request be made known to God. See, he turns around and told us, told us how to do it. And then he tells us, let your request be made known to God. What is a request? Is you're asking for something. Or you're giving a petition. Okay? Psalms 21 and 2 says, You have given him his heart's desire. And what ha have not withheld the request of his lips. 
But you see, there's one thing about giving someone their heart's desire. First, your desire has to be Him. And when your desire is Him, then your desires actually change from worldly things to heavenly things. You see what I mean? It's not just because you hear people say, and this just kind of aggravates me a little bit, but I mean, to a degree, okay, whatever. You hear all these people, oh, God will give you your heart's desire. Just ask him. Well, what is your desire? You want a new boat? You need a new Lamborghini? You want a bucket full of money? Or is your desire to follow him? And do what he says do. And do it the way he says do it. And then your desires turn totally around away from the world. And to want what his will is. And he'll give you the things that you need. Because we need him more than we need the things of the world. That's when the heart's desire is changed. And he says, and have not withheld the request of his lips. That's not because he asked for things. Because his request and his heart's desire were the things of God. His life has been changed. And it also turns around and says, let your request be made known. And I'm breaking this down for a reason. I'm getting there. Just hang on. Be made known. That little phrase, that one little phrase, to be, to, to be made known means to certify or declare. Make known to give to understanding. First John 5 and 15 says, And if we know that he hears us, whatever we asked, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So we know what we've asked of him. And he hears us. Whatever we ask. John 15 and 15. It says, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. And this is Jesus. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. So we have to make things known to God. Okay? We have to let him know. You know, if, if you hear people say, well, God already knows what you need. Yeah, he does. But he wants us to ask. He wants us to make it known to him. He wants us to verbally say these things to him. Make it known to him. Let him know that you, you understand that you, he cares and that whatever, whatever you ask, he's, he'll do for you as long as we're doing, staying in his will and seeking him. Okay, so that's what he's talking about. Now we're going back up to another one. It said in there, but, ev but everything in prayer. I left that one off for a reason. We're going to camp out just for a minute here. In prayer. Remember, thanksgiving and supplication. Supplication is a little bit different from prayer, but yet the same thing. You be, be, you're humble. You're on your knees. You're, bro you, you're broken. You, you, you're wanting to talk to him in that right way. But prayer is speaking, letting him know, making these things known. Okay? That's when you're talking. This is just the way I see it. Webster says prayer is this. A solemn or formal request for help or expression of thanks addressed to God or an object of worship. That's what Webster says. Let me read it again. A solemn or formal request for help or expression of thanks addressed to God. A formal. You know what formal is. I mean, it's just it's being formal. You're, you're going and being straightforward. These are some verses. John 15 and 7 says, if, I abide, if you abide in me, and I read this before, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. You see what it says? Listen to what it says. If you abide in me, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, that's whatever you desire. You see, it goes back to that what I was talking about last week, commands. This is a command, but yet it's a promise. This says that he will do our desires if we're abiding in him and doing what his word says. Kind of changes the way a definition of prayer is. 
It makes you think a little bit. It makes a person think, am I doing right? It's not that we're supposed to be just constantly having ourselves in turmoil of questions about our life with him, but it's knowing in our heart what we're doing is right with him. Matthew 21 and 22, it says, Whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. That's a promise also. And God can't break his promise. He can't. He won't. But we also have to believe. Whenever we go to God in prayer, do we have doubts? Do we have fears? Do we wonder, well, I just wonder if he's listening. I just wonder if he even cares. I wonder if he'll even do it. He does it for everybody else, but he won't do it for me. Come on. What makes you any different? He says, if you abide in me and I'm your word, and then he'll do it. He says, ask whatever you want and believe. You will receive. Mark 11, 24 says, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them. Believe that you receive them and you will have them. Believing. But see, that there's, there's, let me throw this in there. There's one thing about prayer that I truly believe <clears throat> is the fact is making ourselves right with Him. Making ourselves right with Him. Not just going to Him with a bunch of babbling words. <clears throat> it's making ourselves right with Him. Having that childlike faith knowing that He will, knowing that He'll take care of us, knowing that He'll do everything that His Word says that He'll do. He made promises, and He can't break them, and He won't break them. I believe that with all my heart. My favorite verse, my fa one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I even had this thing embroidered on the back of one of my fishing shirts one time. Ask, and it shall be given. Knock, and the door will be open. Seek, and you shall find. It may not be in the right order. Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and that door will be open. And he's talking about coming to him. You do, to me, to me, if a person does those three things, they'll get so close to the Father that they'll know that he'll answer their prayers. Every one of us in this room, I have no doubt in my mind that God has answered your prayer one time or another, at least once. Is that not proof enough that he'll do it? How many times does he have to answer our prayers to get us to believe and to trust and know that his word is true? How many times? Does he have to do this to convince us? Look, I hear your cries. I want to do this for you. Just keep asking and keep knocking and keep seeking. You'll get it. It's coming. Colossians 4 and 2, it says, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. So see, it tells us to continue in prayer. Remember over in Thessalonians, it says, Pray without ceasing. I read a thing the other day studying on this, and it just angered me when I read it. It did. It just, it just made me mad. I could not, I, I, I just asked this guy on the computer, how could you write this? I did. I, I just, I said, how, how can you write this? Because a man said a person cannot pray without ceasing. He said he can't do it. I said, you crazy? I'm not perfect at it. But friends, how can you not stop talking to God? How can you just not talk to him? It's not talking to him, praying. How can you not think about him just all day long, even at work or whatever? Or somebody comes up and you say in your heart, you know, I just wonder if this person knows Jesus. Are you not thinking? Are you not praying? Are you not? You can. It can be done. You can pray without ceasing. You can talk to God all the time, constantly talking to him. The word continue means, and, and this is what the word continue in prayer means. That little phrase means constant. Constant. And it also says loyal. Constantly loyal. Talking to him. Also the words mean, that the word continue also means this, to be devoted. 
to be devoted. If you're going to continually do something, you're going to be devoted to it. And if you're devoted to something, that means you love it. And you want to be with it. And you want to talk to it. You want to spend time with it. It means to be devoted to show one's self courageous. You ever thought of prayer being courageous? The Bible says come to him and boldly. If you're going to be bold, you're going to be courageous. It also means to preserve and not to faint. Don't give up. Don't faint. It also means continue all the time. That's what the word continue means. So Paul says continue in prayer. I think the man was wrong when he wrote that, what he did. I do. And, and that's me. Y'all may think different. I don't know. But the Bible says do it. If the Bible says do it, then someone out there did it. And if they did it, then I can do it. I told you, if this was good enough for them, is it not good enough for us 2,000 years later? He said he never changed. He said he never will change. So nothing changes. Nothing has stopped. This other little phrase... Watch in the same with thanksgiving. The, that little verse, it says, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. This one little phrase, let me, let me just read this. I like what this writer wrote here. It says, believers are to be watchful in prayer. You ever gave any thought of that? Be watchful in prayer. How, how do you watch when you're praying? You know, you ever gave any thought? It says, be watchful in prayer. This carries the idea of standing guard. Okay? Standing guard while you're praying. And someone may say, well, why would you stand guard when you're praying? How many times have you ever heard someone say, well, I pray every night when I go to bed. Hmm? I'm not pointing any fingers. I'm just as guilty as anybody. I pray every time I go to bed. You start praying, next thing you know, your alarm clock's going off. You're not standing watch. You're not being watchful because Satan wants to keep you from talking to God. He don't want you talking to God. He don't want you talking to the Father. He don't want you praising Him. He don't want you pleading with Him. He don't want you humbling yourself before Him. He don't want you doing anything pertaining to God. I know there's times whenever Lisa and myself will be sitting there praying and, and a phone will go to ringing. And whatever, anything that will distract you. That's why we have to be watchful. That's why we have to pay attention to our environment, what's around us, what, what's going on, so that when we go to it, it says believers are to be watchful in prayer. This carries the idea of standing guard or staying awake at night. That's a kicker, ain't it? Staying awake at night to make sure a location is safe. While you're praying. While you're praying. Prayer demands ongoing attention. It does. It, 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 it demands ongoing attention. Just like the guard at a city gate. In, part, put, <clears throat> in terms, this means prayer is not supposed to be careless, casual, or a frivolous act. We should pray with specific purpose and with a deliberate intent. I love what that what was what, what was wrote. Prayer is not supposed to be something that is careless and just some frivolous act. It's not. It's not. It's sincere. And you're supposed to mean business when you go to the Father. You're supposed to. We're supposed to do these things. Romans twelve and twelve says, Rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation continually, steadfastly in prayer. Another one, Matthew 6 and 6 says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and the which thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. This tells us that we need to be alone with Him. We need to be alone with Him. Whether you go in a closet or whatever you have to do to get along with him. That's what you're supposed to do. 
Second Chronicles 7 and 14, y'all know this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will hear from heaven and heal their land. You know, I've done a message on that. But you see in here, it goes right along with what we've been talking about. Will humble themselves and pray. A supplication. Will humble themselves and pray. And seek my face. And turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven. You see, humble, pray, seek, and turn. All of those things. Then he'll do what he said he'll do. You see? All of those things. And just look at all the things that we just read. And these are just a few about prayer in the Bible. These are just a few of them. James 5 and 15, 16, it says, Confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. But see what it says? Pray for one another that you may be healed. And then it goes on and says, The effective, fervent prayer. Or the King James says effectual, fervent. Prayer of a righteous man avails much. Effective, fervent means mighty. The mighty prayer of a person. A mighty prayer of a righteous man. The word avail means to be strong. To be robust, to be sound in health. So see, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You see, it changes. It, it changes a person. And it does. This one other one. This is a verse, and to be honest with you, I, I've never really paid any attention. And maybe you all have. I hope you have. You remember whenever Jesus, in the Bible, in the Bible that we read here, it tells about Jesus, his birth. You know, it tells that little area of his life. The next time you hear him, he's 12. They went to the temple, you know, and he told his mama, you know, I'm about my father's business. I heard a guy, t <laughs> this is so funny. I heard a guy said, you know, whenever Jesus said, don't you know that I'm supposed to be about my father's business? And he said, that wouldn't have worked with me. You know, I thought that was still going to be the death. You know, he turned his head around. Anyway, so Jesus, born, 12 years old. Then the next time you hear about him, he's going to be baptized. You know, he is. He, he's, he's fixing to start his, he's fixing to start his, his, his time of preaching and teaching and healing and all that. He's going to be baptized. In Luke 3 and 21, if you want to look at it, you can. It, it, look at, it says, when all the people were baptized, and this was John the Baptist, you know, he's baptizing people. It says, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And he was. You all know, you all know this. It says, and it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized, and while he prayed, while he prayed, the heaven was open. And it says that the Spirit came in the form of a dove. You ever notice that? It, it never really registered to me. But he was baptized and praying. Baptized and praying. One, just one of the first events as he began his, his ministry journey. It says he was baptized and praying. Baptized and praying. Jesus himself. And this is something next week we're going to continue on. But can you imagine Jesus himself, the, one of the first things he did was prayer. Talking to the Father. Talking to him. He went and talking to him. I just thought that was so amazing that he was, he was baptized in prayer. It says, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Now if you'll look at that same thing that we just read, Philippians 4 and 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, listen, but in everything by prayer, okay? So you're supposed to be doing this and supplication. That means something else has to go along with it, okay? 
with thanksgiving. So that's telling you that you need to throw this in there. This needs to be in there. Let your request be made known to God. Look at verse 7. The next word, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Peace of God. The peace of God. So this is an addition. Peace of God means a state of national tranquility, exemption from rage and havoc. The Messiah's peace. The Messiah's peace. The tranquil state of soul assured of its salvation through Christ and so fearing nothing from God. Listen. And so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatsoever sort that is. That's peace. That peace of God. You see, if you do all of these things, pray without, you know, everything in prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, making requests known to God and the peace of God. This, which surpasses all understanding. The word surpass means to stand out, to rise above, even over the top. Way, way beyond our imagination, way beyond our thinking. It also means superior in rank, authority, and even power. Better than better is what one of the definitions was, and I like that one. Better than, I mean, if something is better, how better can it get? You know, better than better. Excellency, higher, pass, and even supreme. So the peace of God, which is supreme and better than better, will guard your hearts and minds. Through Christ Jesus. And y'all know what the word guard means. It means to protect. Protect. And to keep. Wouldn't it be so great to know. Or isn't it so great to know. And it can be so great to know. That God himself. Can put so much peace. With inside of you. Inside of your heart. And your mind. That you know that you are protected. And he keeps you keeps you all of these things all of these things that he says if we do these things and his peace that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and minds why do we need it to guard our hearts and minds because of the way we think period the things that we think about the things that we're not supposed to be thinking about what about our hearts? Y'all heard me talk about it time and time and time again about the heart, not the thump, thump, but the deep part of the heart that God wants. Because he said, love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart. So who would be the best one to keep our heart? Would be him. And by doing prayer, supplication and thanksgiving and making our request known to God. We get His peace that surpasses all understanding that will keep our hearts and minds. All of these things. One other little verse I want to read to you. At Philippians 4 and 7 that we just read, and this is in the New Living Translation, okay? Verse 7. This is in the New Living Translation. And I like the way this reads. It says, then you will experience God's peace. And that brings up a question. Have any of us ever truly experienced God's peace? Has any of us ever truly experienced the peace of God? Can any of us say that? Again, if you've never have, ask him. He'll give it to you. I just read it. Said he would. And if for some reason you don't believe that he, uh, he believes you, read it to him. You said this. Okay? Just read it to him. Okay? Then you will experience God's peace with which exceeds everything we can understand. Way beyond our understanding. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So see, in this little verse, it throws in another little kicker. As you live in Christ Jesus. So how do we get this? How do, how do we get this? 
How do we get this peace that it's talking about? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, letting your requests be made known to God. That's how you get it. That's the answer.